Hello, my name is Susan Coyne. I work as both an actor and a playwright and a screenwriter, so I spend my life immersed in stories, thinking about how they work, what makes them compelling, and why we crave them so. Lately, I've been working in what's called a writer's room in Hollywood. That's where a group of people sit around a table full of sugary snacks and uh, map out an entire season of television on a whiteboard. We do this day after day for months on end until miraculously we come up with 10 or 20 or 22 scripts, however many the order is for. One of the things that's most surprising to me about writing for TV and other screenplays is how technical it is. First of all, there's the problem of uh, page count. That means around 60 pages for an hour-long drama or 45 for an hour of network TV or 22 for a three-camera sitcom. Then there's the structure of the story itself. There must be a teaser to grab the viewer's attention, and after that, the stakes must continue to climb, and there must be an all-is-lost moment in the middle, and then it must all resolve in a satisfying way on page 58, or, in the case of Netflix, create an insatiable urge to binge the rest of the series. <laughs> Additionally, each episode must further the emotional arc of the three or four or five main characters. Now, I'm speaking about serialized television with sitcoms or medical dramas or legal shows. It's the opposite. At the end of each episode, the show resets, and we're right back where we started from. As a result of all these technical demands, there are now a vast number of books which purport to teach you the secret to screenwriting. And I know this because I'm embarrassed to say I have most of them. <laughs> Why? First, because reading them is much easier than sitting down and actually writing. And secondly, because I have a truly irrational hope that somewhere, someone can tell me how to make it less painful. Most of these books base their ideas on the work of Joseph Campbell, whose book, The Hero with the Thousand Faces, identified what became as known as the monomyth, the idea that nearly every culture's mythical framework shares certain common archetypes and structure. And his work gained popularity when George Lucas, the writer of Star Wars, cited Campbell as a major influence. One of these best-selling screenwriting gurus, a former executive at Disney, has helpfully boiled Campbell's work down to 12 elements that he thinks must be part of every story. And if you're thinking of writing a screenplay, here they are. The ordinary world, the call to adventure, refusal of the call, meeting with the mentor, crossing the first threshold, tests, allies, and enemies, approach to the innermost cave, the ordeal, the reward, the road back, the resurrection, return with the elixir. You're welcome. <laughs> I enjoy writing for television, but this obsession with structure can feel a lot like math, which is where everything seems to end up these days with an algorithm. My heart sank when I read that a group of researchers had recently asked a computer to identify how many types of stories there are based on nearly 2,000 works of fiction. The answer, six. Six, really, just six. It seems that the more money is at stake, the more there will be people who are trying to figure out a formula and writers who will feel pressured to apply it. Which is why I like to return to my first love here in the theater. Theater is the opposite in every way of an algorithm. It is analog, not digital. It happens in real time in front of real people. A play's structure evolves out of the subject matter, not the other way around. It is as basic as storytelling can be. There's a book we all read in theater school called The Empty Space by Peter Brook. The book's first line is famous. I can take an empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him, and this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged. Brooke's been labeled an avant-garde director, but in fact his whole aim was to return the theater to its origins in ritual and myth, to what he called holy theater. And this was in contrast to what he called deadly theater. And I probably don't need to, to, to explain what that is to you. I'm sure we've all experienced it. And here let me say there is nothing, nothing worse than being in a bad production. I, I don't know why, but it is the worst. And I'm sure that never happens here, by the way. 
As Brooke pointed out, theater and religion have a lot in common. Both have costumes, actors or priests, an audience, a congregation, a temple, the theater, and a liturgy, which in the theater is called a script. But of course, the theater is not a church. It offers no dogma, no prescriptions for how to behave. It will not save your soul. It is or ought to be an experience both sacred and profane, transcendent and deeply human. To state the obvious, theater is live. Audiences and performers share the same space, breathe the same air. And what happens in the best situations is a kind of alchemy. In fact, researchers have found that watching a live theater performance can synchronize your heartbeat with other people in the audience, regardless of whether you know them or not, producing a common physiological experience. This doesn't surprise me. I remember as an actor at Stratford, I used to peek out at the audience at the end of our performance of King Lear to watch the faces of the audience, to watch how their expressions mirrored those of the actors, no longer individuals, but a community of believers. And this is what makes storytelling in the theater unique. Richard Eyre ran the National Theater for many years and has written extensively about theater. Recently, he wrote, why is the theater an important art form today? Because it's an expression of our humanness. Because it can't be digitized. It's irreproducible. It can't be stored or recorded. It's live, unrepeatable, ephemeral, even at its greatest. It happens in the present tense and lives on only in the memory. It can never resolve its reliance on the scale of the human figure and the sound of the human voice and our desire to tell each other stories. Because when you go to the theater, you go in as an individual and you emerge as an audience. We live in what's often called the golden age of television. And at the same time, we're living through an epidemic of loneliness. I wonder if there isn't a connection as we become increasingly isolated, staying at home in front of our screens, are we missing what is most essential to storytelling, the presence of other people? What theaters offer us is perhaps an antidote, a place where our imaginations can meet and mingle together in real time, where our hearts can beat as one, where we can become, for a short time, a community. It's something that television, no matter how golden, can never do. Thank you.